All right. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EFA uh, revision session prepared to pass arranged by ACCA. Uh, my name is Apart Knoo. Just a very brief introduction. I'm an ACCA member and a certified internal auditor. I have been teaching F8 for a very long time, I think over 10 years. Um, I have had the opportunity to meet your examiner on a number of occasions. Um, there was a learning providers conference a few weeks ago, um, and these examiner conferences happen every two years. So a lot of information that I will give you today, so things about exam techniques or common reasons for failure, um, they're a combination of what's up on the, web, on the website um, in examiner reports, along with my discussions with the examiner or examining team individually as well. Just to give you a brief idea um, about how we're going to proceed, uh, a few housekeeping rules. You can type in your questions um, as we go along. However, I will not be able to see these questions until I tell you now is the quick question and answer time. So I'm going to, for example, teach a topic. I'll um, give you a few minutes to type in your questions and I'll try and answer as many as I possibly can. Um, if you could all please make sure that whatever concerns you have, you can just keep typing them in, but I will answer them whenever we have the question and answer time. Um, again, please understand that this is um, roughly 15 hour webinar. So it is almost impossible for us to cover 100% of the syllabus. So the focus of the webinar is going to be on the technical topics. So the entire audit process. I'm going to start off by uh, discussing um, factors to consider before you accept clients, move on to engagement letter, planning stage, substantive controls, et cetera, et cetera. However, even within substantive and internal controls, I'm not going to be able to cover 100% of the topics, but I will be choosing those areas which are slightly more difficult, and I'll focus on the technique so that we're in a much better position to cover all sorts of problems as we go along. So if we begin, um, you must be familiar if you are a person who's taking the FIT exam for the first time, or if you are resetting this exam, either way, you need to be very comfortable with the paper pattern. Section A of the FIT exam has three case-based questions. So there are three case studies, and then you have five objective test questions worth 20 marks each. If you're taking the paper-based version, these questions will only have multiple choice questions. So four options, you have to select one. However, if you're taking your FIT exam as a computer-based exam, then you might have different types of objective test questions. But either way, section A, 30 marks, three case studies, and then five questions each. Section B has one 30 mark question and two 20 mark questions. Your examiner has said that section B would include a lot of questions from your audit process. So the planning stage, the controls, the substantive review opinion, etc. But there's absolutely no trend. There's absolutely no trend that the 30 mark question will always be from a certain topic. So you have to prepare the entire syllabus of the F8 exam. If you're taking the paper based exam, your allowed time is three hours, 15 minutes. This is only for those who are taking the paper based exam which basically gives you 1.95 minutes per mark. Now, this time allocation is very, very important because one of the main reasons for not being able to get through the exam is not completing the paper. So I will talk about how you need to time manage each part, but please remember, roughly you have 1.95 minutes per mark available, but that's not the time that we will use to actually attend the questions. However, if you're taking your computer-based exam, you only have three hours available for the 100 mark paper, all right? So that's slightly different um, for computer-based. My first um, quick overview is basically a discussion on common reasons for not being able to get through the FIT exam. So before I actually <clears throat> start the technical area, a few things which are common problems 
faced by the students. The first one is insufficient number of relevant points to obtain a pass standard. So for example, for questions regarding substantive procedures, if the examiner asks you to talk about or write down audit procedures on a certain area, if it's a six mark question, you should know that you need to write a minimum of six points. Similarly, if I'm asking you to identify five strengths in internal controls, you should be able to identify at least five or maybe one extra. So if you're not able to uh, write down sufficient number of points, you might struggle to get to the ACCA F8 exam. This is one of the most problematic one. If you've not explained your comments in detail, you're not going to get through the exam. Now, I'm going to give very specific F8 examples. When you are talking about internal control deficiencies, simply saying good dispatch notes are not pre-numbered. That's barely half a mark. Until you explain why it is a problem, you're not going to be able to get marks. In ACCS Code of Ethics, so professional ethics, simply saying this is self-interest is not sufficient. You'll have to tell me what the interest in this particular example is. So if you do not explain your comments in sufficient detail, you're not going to be able to get through the exam. Students are not comfortable with audit procedures and audit process. Now, I'm hoping that by the end of this um, session today, so by Friday, you should be able to technically understand what the audit process is. I do understand that there will be quite a few of you who've never actually been on an audit engagement. However, I am going to try and summarize the audit process for you before I start going topic wise. Another thing, another important um, reason for failure, if you simply learn the knowledge and not apply it to the scenario, you're not going to be able to get to the exam. So please, please remember learning a textbook. So you would learn the entire textbook by heart and you would still probably get another 40 marks because you're not applying that knowledge to the scenario. As mentioned earlier, you need to attempt the entire 100 mark exam. Now, this is what I spoke about earlier and this is what I need you to do. I know we have 1.95 minutes per mark available, but in the actual exam, this is the guideline that I'm going to use. So for example, if I'm attempting question number one, so the first OT case, the first case study, that's a 10 mark question. So 10 marks multiplied by 1.5 is 15 minutes. I'm only going to spend 15 minutes on the first case in section A. The minute my 15 minute allocated time is up, I'm going to move on to the second case. Another 15 minutes, move on to the third case. When I reach section B, question number, the first 30 mark question, part A, for example, is seven marks. Again, multiplied by 1.5 minutes, attempt that question in that time allowed and move on to part B. So first exam technique, and please use this, trust me, I've been teaching for a very long time and this works for the students the best. I want you to make sure that for each question, the writing time, I'm only talking about the writing time. The writing time that you take is 1.5 minutes per mark. Once that allocated time is up, you can then move on to the next question. So your F uh, your F8 examining team has mentioned that these five reasons are the most common ones for not being able to get to the ACCA exam. So again, I'm hoping by the time we finish on Friday and by the time I give you the mock to attempt, fingers crossed, you should be in a better position to overcome these areas as well. Um, just to give you a heads up, um, in the document section, in the document section, um, there is, if you could just give me one second, just give me one second.
All right, guys. So, very quickly, insufficient number of points, you should be able to cover those. Not explaining the comments in uh, detail, again, you should be able to cover this by the time we finish today. Not understanding the audit procedures in other areas should be able to cover. Um, applying knowledge to the scenario in the question, as we will be attempting questions during these webinars. This is another portion that you should be more comfortable with and not answering all the questions. 1.5 minutes per mark is the time that I want you to basically take when you're writing down the answers. As mentioned earlier, in the document section, there's a new document that was uploaded um, about half an hour ago. That is something called the knowledge summary. If you could all please type in your chat boxes and confirm that you can see that. If you could please use that knowledge summary to now revise your entire syllabus. So that's basically the entire syllabus of F8 converted into the language which is required by the examiner. It should say knowledge summary June 2017 attempt. So from now onwards, so from this day onwards, whatever material you were using, was it if it was a textbook or any other revision notes, I want you to leave all of that and thus just use the knowledge summary to revise your key points. All right. So that's a very brief um, summary of your entire epic syllabus in the language which is expected by the examiner. So that's a content that I want you to please refer to as we go along. Do you have any questions up till now? Now, um, I am going to officially start with the F8 content in just about a few minutes. Until then, if you have any questions at all, please just type them in your chat box. So any questions at all, guys? Um, I've not really done anything. We're going to focus on um, the technical aspects of F8. That's the first one. Um, I am going to try and attempt as many questions as possible. The paper format, you need to, OK. So if I just quickly go back, section A is you're going to have three mini case studies in section A. So section A is a 30 mark section where you're going to have three mini case studies. From each case study, you're going to have five MCQs if you're taking the paper-based exam and five objective test questions if you're taking the computer-based exam. So section A, three case studies, five questions each. Section B, there are three questions in total. The first question will be 30 marks. The remaining two questions will be 20 marks each. So that's the format of your paper. If it's the paper-based exam, you have three hours available. If it's a computer-based exam, sorry, if it's a paper-based exam, you have three hours, 15 minutes available. If it's computer-based, you only have three hours available. Um, I will not see ethics is not a portion that we are going to um, be able to revise. So we won't be able to revise that in this webinar, but I can give you a very quick overview. Um, so for example, in the scenario, it says the engagement partner has been an engagement partner for the previous nine years. So that's all that is written. A few things that you need to do. The first thing you'll have to do is write this down. That the engagement partner has been with this client for nine years. That's identification. So identifying from the scenario. Then you explain it. You write the name of the threat and then you tell me what the problem is. So this is familiarity, for example. And the partner, because he has a close relationship, he might be too sympathetic and therefore not work objectively. And then you give a recommendation. So identification from the scenario, 
using the threat name, explaining why it is a threat, and then giving the recommendation. Unless you do all of these things, you won't be able to get complete marks. I do have Musavar who is helping me, helping me with the questions. So if I keep saying Musavar in the middle, please don't get worried. Musavar, has, is there any question that I've missed? Because, okay. Uh, the whole syllabus handouts, again, the knowledge summary that has been uploaded, that's the entire syllabus. So knowledge summary covers the entire syllabus. Brilliant, guys. I'm now um, minimizing the chat box, so I won't be looking at any questions until we have the next round. All right. I now have a short quiz from those who have already prepared for FH or if you've already taken the FH exam. So, Masavir, I'm going to need your help now, okay? The first question, I'm not starting FH right now, but in the audit language, what are classes of transactions for the period under review? <coughs> classes of transactions, guys. Masavir, read out if you have any answer. A statement of profit or loss. Anyone else? So classes of transactions for the period under review. This is a technical audit term. One person has given an answer. Is there anyone else? All right, guys. Um, half of you are wrong. A few of you are right. All right. Those of you who did not have to get the right answer. All my items in the statement of profit or loss are called classes of transaction for the period under review. So my PNL items, all my income and my expenses for the year, they are classes for transactions for the period under review. Are you okay? So whenever from now onwards, whenever I say, oh, this is a class of transaction for F8, you should instantly think, Afaf is either talking about income or talking about expenses. So items from the statement of profit or loss. What are account balances at the period end? So if I say, oh, this is an account balance, what do I mean, guys? Anyone? So this is, again, balance sheet. Absolutely right, your statement of financial position. So all the items in the statement of financial position are account balances. What are financial statement disclosures? What are financial statement disclosures, guys? Notes to the accounts. Notes to the accounts. Absolutely right. All right. If I just give you a quick summary, I need you to all please pay attention. If I talk from an accountancy perspective, we have your statement of profit or loss. You have uh, your SOFP, notes to the accounts, uh, statement of changes in equity and statement of cash flows. And then you have something called accounting policies within these financial statements. For F8, I'm not going to talk about statement of cash flows. I'm not going to talk about statement for changes in equity. I will refer to accounting policies but I won't be talking in too much detail about accounting policies. So instead of PL balance sheet and notes to the accounts, you as F8 candidates need to be very familiar with these three statements. My next question is a public company the same as a public sector organization? I, I honestly think it's the same. What, what's your opinion? Is it the same? So you're saying no. Could someone please tell me what a public company is? If in a question I say this is a public company, what does that mean? It's a it's a listed company. So very good. A few words. Your examiner could call it a public company. She could say it's a listed company. She could say it was floated on the stock exchange she could say it's quoted on the stock exchange. 
So public company, again, this is from your earlier studies. If the shares are available for the general public to buy from the stock exchange. Very quickly, what is a public sector organization? It is a not-for-profit organization, but so is a charity. It is a government organization. You are absolutely right. It is a not-for-profit organization, but they are basically state-controlled government organizations. So a public sector organization is separate from a charity. I could even write the word charity, which is also a not-for-profit organization, but completely different from a public sector organization. So these are a few words that you need to be very comfortable with. So words that I'm going to use in my webinar and you need to know what they mean because they're actually a part of your audience syllabus as well. Any questions up to here guys? We've not, we're now officially starting the content, but before we start, if you have any questions at all, please let me know. Fine. All right guys. So I'm now going to tell you a story. I want you to forget you're actually studying FH for my storyboard. So these blank slides are my storyboards. Forget I'm teaching FH, forget you're studying FH. I'm just going to tell you a little story that you need to understand. Now we have something called firms. Firms or you could say practitioners. So for example, Ernst & Young, PwC, KPMG, Deloitte, these are the big four audit firms as we've heard. Now audit firms or these practitioners of firms, they earn money by offering a variety of assignments. So I went on a firm's website and they said, we offer assurance engagements and we offer engagements where no assurance is given. And I have no idea what that means. So I actually called them up and I said, what are you talking about? What is this assurance engagement? So they said, listen, if you or your management has prepared something and you want us to come and check that something, we're happy to do it for you. So we can check work that you have done and we can give you assurance whether according to us that work has been done correctly or not. And within that, we have two further categories. If you want us to do a lot of work and maybe do a bit more in-depth checking, we'll give you reasonable assurance. So this basically means I'm going to do a bit more work, a bit more in-depth checking, but then I'll be able to give you reasonable assurance on whether we believe this is okay or not. However, if you do not want us to do this much work, or maybe if you don't want that high a level of assurance, we can also give you limited assurance on that area that you want us to check. So within this, we will look for obvious problems only. If we find a problem, we're happy to check that problem in detail. So as a firm, I can give you two types or two levels of assurance. If I give you a reasonable assurance because I'm doing more work, my wording would start with in our opinion. However, if I'm giving you limited assurance and looking for obvious problems only, my wording in my report will start with nothing has come to our attention, etc. etc. So the firm is basically telling you that if you have a subject matter, Subject matter is the work that you've done as the management and you want assurance on that subject matter. We can either give you reasonable assurance or we can give you limited assurance. If you do not want assurance, 
you simply want to get some work done, we are actually happy to do that as well. So instead of us checking something, we can do the work for you. If you want us to compile financial information, so a compilation engagement is one where I can compile financial information for you. So I can prepare the financial statements for you. I can actually make the non-current asset register for you. So if you want us to compile financial information, we offer compilation engagements. If there's any other work you want us to do, we're happy to do that as well. So agreed upon procedure. I'm the bank. I want someone to come at nine o'clock in the morning, wait in the waiting area, and make a report about the waiting times that each customer had to face. So the practitioner, they're doing an agreed upon procedure. They're going to send an employee or a trainee. He's going to sit at the reception and note down the waiting time of each customer. Five o'clock, he's going to type up a report, give that report to the management and go back home. So I'm not checking anything, I'm just performing an agreed upon procedure. So my story is that a firm could be offering assurance engagements or no assurance engagements. Within assurance engagements, they could either be giving a reasonable level of assurance or a limited level of assurance. So as FH students, these are technical areas that you need to be prepared for. Before I take questions, I need a bit of technical information about, sorry, not this, about what an assurance engagement is. So a quick revision. An assurance engagement is any engagement in which there are three parties, there's a subject matter, there's suitable criteria, you gather evidence and you give a written conclusion. So five elements of an assurance engagement. Audit, external audit as we know it, is an example of a reasonable assurance engagement. So an external audit is one, if I apply this, the responsible party is the board of directors who have prepared the financial statements. The intended users are the shareholders. The practitioner is the firm. Subject matter are the financial statements. So the board have prepared these financial statements. The firm is going to check these financial statements and give a report to the intended user. They are going to match these financial statements to the reporting framework. So how do I know the inventory figure is correct? I compare it to IS2. How do I know their revenue recognition is okay? I compare it with IFRS 15. So the suitable criteria against which the subject matter is evaluated, in my example, are the reporting standards. Auditors have to gather sufficient appropriate evidence. At the end of the audit, if you're saying that these financial statements do not give a true and fair view, then you need to have appropriate evidence to actually support this conclusion. And you give an assurance report. Because this is a reasonable assurance engagement, you will always start off with, in our opinion. Because like we studied, this is a reasonable assurance engagement. Just a few things. Um, I'm just going to very quickly cover why we do an external audit, and then I'll take the questions. Although I know you would basically partially know what external audit is, I need to give you another story that you have to be comfortable with. If I talk about a listed company, 
So a public company, shareholders are the ones who own the company and directors are the ones who run the company. And this is what we've already known. So if I have shares in a listed company, I actually can't sit on the board and take decisions. Now these directors are also responsible for preparing the financial statements. And as accounting students, we know that these financial statements are basically telling you about the financial position and performance of the company. Now these directors, they have a few concerns. What they want to do is they might try to manipulate these financial statements. So they might to show, want to show extra assets and income. They might want to hide their liabilities and expenses. I'm only telling you a story that these directors, they know that the financial statements actually represent their performance. If my profit from the last year has gone up, the directors have done well. If the company is continuously making losses, the directors are not performing their role well. So they actually have the, the motivation to try and manipulate the financial statements by overstating their assets and income and understating their liabilities and expenses. My shareholders know all of this. So they know that the directors might be trying to manipulate the financial statements. So what they need to do is they want to hire an independent third party to give reasonable assurance on the financial statements. So as F8 students, you're never going to be asked to explain why do you get an audit done. But you need to understand that as auditors, we are independent third party. Third party means I cannot be a shareholder, I cannot be a director. I have to be a third party. So other than these two. And when I'm giving reasonable assurance, I will keep looking for these problems. I will keep looking for ways they might be trying to hide their liabilities and expenses, and they might be trying to overstate their assets and income. So before we start the audit process, a few things you need to be comfortable with because these are topics that are not covering in detail. You should know difference between reasonable and limited assurance engagements. You should know the difference between assurance and no assurance engagements. You should know the elements of an assurance engagement and you should be comfortable with the independence aspect of the auditors. So the entire code of ethics or your professional ethics, you need to be comfortable with that so that you can evaluate whether this third party is truly independent or not. So this was a fast forward version of the topics that I will not be covering in detail. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. So now is the time. You have the option of typing in your questions in the chat boxes. And I'll see if I can answer as many as possible. All right, guys. Any questions at all, guys? I'll be typing in. Okay. 
um, would the subject matter include director's report as well for external audit? I'm glad you asked this question. For external audit, my subject matter is only financial statements for external audit. But you can get assurance on any subject matter. So to answer your question, for external audit, my subject matter is only the financial statements. We will, at, we will look at inconsistencies between director's report and financial statements. But I will only give an opinion on the financial statements. This is something that you need to be very clear on. In the MCQs, no, the, um, the questions can be from any topics at all. So there is no trend at all. Please don't try to predict what's going to come. It is not a 10 day session. The session finishes on Friday. Um, section B has three questions, uh, Nasir. The first question is 30 marks. Question number two and the next two questions are 20 marks each. All topics are important for the exam, Bashir. All topics. Amjad, Amjad Bashir, all topics are important. Uh, no, this is important. Yusra, criteria is IAS. So financial statements are the subject matter. I match them to the reporting framework. So as auditors, I need to make sure financial statements have been prepared accordingly in relation to the reporting framework, not the auditing standards. For external audit, users are shareholders. I prepare my report for the shareholders. Third parties can use them, other stakeholders can use them, but that's not my headache. As an external auditor, my financial state, my report is for the shareholders only. Directors will try to manipulate the financial statement to Sama because they, they reflect their performance. If financial statements show a worsening position, that automatically tells the, tells the shareholders that directors have not made the right decisions. So they want to hide the fact that they did not perform well. The third party, the independent third party is the external auditor. The external auditor is the third party. So an external auditor cannot be a shareholder. It cannot be a director. They have to be a third party other than a shareholder and director. I will not be able to cover a uh, code of ethics guys. If you have specific questions regarding self interest, familiarity, etc., please read the knowledge summary and maybe they'll become easier. If you understand that, I will not be able to cover code of ethics because that's not something I can go into detail. If we have time left on Friday, we can cover it. Non assurance engagements are any engagements where you're doing the work instead of checking the work. So in simple English, assurance means someone else has done the work. I need to check it and give assurance. No assurance means I'm going to be doing the work. So there's no checking in what it's actually performing the work. Review engagements are an example of a limited assurance engagement. So audit is reasonable assurance and review is limited assurance. Directors cannot appoint auditors. They can recommend appointments, but the final approval has to come from the general meetings guys. Compilation engagement is any engagement where you have to work with financial information. So compile financial information. You could compile it as interim accounts. You could compile it as financial statements. You could be making registers, etc. 
preparation of financial statements is an example of a non assurance engagement review and audit the difference has already been discussed audit is reasonable assurance review is limited assurance yes suitable criteria means ifrs only because we are doing the international version guys so yes for us the suitable criteria is your international accounting standards writing style matters for section b yes scope of audit means what are you checking so external audit my scope is just the financial statements so what comes in my sp scope in other words what do i have to give assurance on no please do not give reference to isas at all Ass any topic can come in any section assurance can come in section a section b anything at all you have to link your answers to the scenarios not to the isas no 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 auditor can never be an employee of a client it has they have to be an independent third party so they should not have anything to do with the client at all i will not be doing any exam standard question on ethics no guys you have the start you have the course plan um ms avi do we have the course plan uploaded all right i will we will upload the study plan today or the webinar plan that will mention the topics that we will cover in the webinar osama members can perform management work why firm members cannot perform management this i mean i know that why firm members cannot perform management work in non assurance engagement yes they can so non assurance engagement is exactly one where you're doing something that the management could have done themselves as well but instead they decided to outsource it so they can where is the chat box um, good luck i want to confirm that in external audit the level of assurance is reasonable external audit is always a reasonable assurance engagement high level is reasonable level there is no higher level than reasonable so reasonable is the highest level you do not have to write isas in the answers Yes, it's the shareholders who appoint them. All right, guys. I'm flicking through the questions now. I'm going to have to skip a few. All right. All right, guys. I'm now moving on. I'm now moving on to um, the first part. Um, I'm minimizing the chat chat box now. So any questions that you are typing, I will not be able to see. All right. Um, before i actually start the topic wise um sort of uh, discussion relevant to f8 i'm going to tell you the audit process as a story so i'm actually now going to tell you again as before this is my story board i'm pretending that i'm not teaching f8 okay so you're an engineer who just wants to understand how an audit is done so i'm just going to use very simple terminology so the entire technical portion of f8 process or this um, audit process is going to be summarized now i want you to pay attention please do not type or write anything just listen this is the important part so for example we've just discussed that we need to sort of check don't ever use the word check i'm only using it because it's a simpler word to understand so i need to sort of check the financial statements and tell whether in my opinion financial statements are okay or not how do i actually check the financial statements 
the first thing i need to do is something called planning so what's going to happen is when you actually reach the audit client i want you to understand the business in detail so you reach you are people who have never done an audit you've never heard of an audit you reach the audit client i want you to ask questions i want you to look at policy manuals i want you to look at the marketing documents i want you to understand what has been happening or what happens in the company on the basis of the information that you get i want you to tell me which areas of financial statements are at a risk of fraud or error so what does that actually mean you said afaf i was standing in the lift so the lift and i heard someone say the company gives profit linked bonuses the minute i heard that i quickly realized that profit is an area that might be at a risk of fraud i am concerned that they might be trying to show extra profit so that they get extra bonuses i said fine that's a very good point there was this another person he said when i was looking at the files i saw that there is a lawsuit which has been filed by a customer so a customer who came to the premises he slipped because there was some water and he broke his leg now the customer has filed a lawsuit against the company and the decision has not yet been taken so when you were understanding the business another thing you found out was the lawsuit as accountants i need to see which areas of financial statements could have fraud or error so you ran back to your room and you said maybe provision so if it is probable that we will lose the lawsuit maybe there's a provision which needs to be made if not a provision maybe a contingent liability disclosure so the first thing that you have to do that's what you need to focus on as auditors the first thing that you have to do is try and find out which areas of the financial statements have a greater chance of fraud or error so in any audit that's the first stage of your work so at the end of this process you think it's only these two only the profit figure which actually covers everything and then the provision of contingent liability disclosure these are the areas which are at a risk of fraud or error once you have this list the next thing i want you to do is work on the system of preparing financial statements the second stage i want you to go to the purchase manager ask him how they record the purchase figure i want you to go to the sales manager and to the payroll manager ask the same question how do you actually record the sales figure how do you actually record the payroll figure when you buy property plant and equipment how do you record this information so in the audit process the second stage is trying to understand this system of preparing the financial statements at the next stage i want you to confirm the amounts and the disclosures that have been recorded in the financial statements so at the third stage this was the very first time 
when I started working on the sales revenue amount recorded in the PNL. Income, expenses, assets, liabilities. Confirm whether these amounts are accurate, complete, etc. Any notes to the accounts, are they correct or not? Has the company given all the disclosures? So at the third stage, you are going to work in detail to confirm the classes of transactions and related disclosures, the account balances and related disclosures. So if I put names to this, first stage is where you carry out risk assessment. Second stage is called internal controls testing. Third stage is called substantive testing. So these three are just very fancy words for planning systems and confirmation of amounts. If you just give me one second, I'm just going to bring up a new slide over here. If you are working on the sales figure, if you're working on the sales figure in the statement of profit or loss, the first thing you did was you wanted to see if each area was risky or not. So each class of transaction, you wanted to find the chances of fraud or error. So fraud and error. You did this for each class of transaction. You have to do this for each account balance. Then you wanted to know the system of preparing financial statements. So for each profit and loss item, for each SOFP item, you're going to focus on the way that amount was recorded. Then you're going to confirm the amounts and related disclosures. So each class of transaction, each account balance, you want to know if these amounts are correct. You want to know if these amounts are complete. You want to know if they have been recorded in the correct accounting period, etc. And these three stages have fancy names. This is the planning stage of audit. This is where you check the internal controls over financial reporting. And this is called the substantive stage of audit. So your examining team, your examiner has repeatedly said that students need to be very clear, not for passing FH, but in real life. You need to be very clear the three level of levels or stages that we focus on before we actually conduct the review and then give an opinion. So before conducting review and opinion, these are the stages that we follow in audit. Any questions regarding what is up on the screen right now? I'm not going to answer any technical questions right now. Don't ask me what certain FA topics mean. I'm just asking as a layman, as a person who's never been on an audit engagement, do you understand that we will first try to find out which areas have risk of fraud and error? We will then focus on the system of preparing financial statements and then we will confirm the amounts and disclosures. Do you understand in this in the most basic terms? All right. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. So please remember, if I now talk about FH, 
there will always always be a question in your exam from this stage there will always be a question in your exam from this stage there will always be a question from this stage so if you understand them conceptually you would be able to attempt those questions in a much better manner and either in section a or section b there will always be a question from this stage as well maybe a combined question maybe independent but these four questions or these four topics will definitely be tested in your audit exam there is no way out of this okay now this is what i am going to focus on in the webinar i'm now going to start the technical teaching i will first talk about how or what factors to consider when you are getting new assignments i'm going to talk about the engagement letter today we will cover audit planning we will then go on to internal control substantive review and opinion so when you get the study plan you will know that the webinars from today to friday will cover the audit process and the technical areas of this process the first part you should know what a firm or a practitioner means now okay your auditing standards say that before you accept a new client there are a few things that you need to consider so maybe i advertised in the newspaper maybe i submitted or i want to submit a tender for an assurance 